Hey there, welcome to uh, this week's podcast or vlogcast or whatever you're <laughs> listening or watching this on or whatever we're calling it. Um, this week I want to um, talk about language that we use in yoga. I uh, did a um, post, social media post um, a couple of days ago and I just called it language and with exclamation marks and um, <laughs> it got a lot of feedback and those of you who know me will know where I'm going with this those of you who don't know me we the way that yoga teachers use language is so impactful uh, in many ways on yoga students the specific language I want to talk about um, here is um, the words pose and the variations pose variations and pose modifications. These are words that so many yoga teachers use. There is a yoga pose, there is a uh, pose modification, and if you've nailed the pose, well then there are variations. These words infer by their very use that there is a standard pose. And uh, if you go on the internet and search Pashimottanasana, or Trikonasana, or Urdhvadhanarasana, so seated forward fold, uh, triangle pose, or uh, wheel pose, there will be standards. And sometimes you'll see, um, or there'll be very obvious right and wrong ways of doing these pose. And some, so particularly social media posts, you'll see all these arrows and labels saying, lengthen this and pull this in that and do that. And then you can do, quote unquote, or air quotes, the pose. This, all of this language and that, that imagery with all the arrows and do this and do that, pull this in and lengthen that and do that, all implies that you are going, we are going somewhere with a pose. We are going to a standard, a standard shape, which we all can achieve if we do all of those things, as the teachers say. I want to challenge in this mini podcast all of these ideas. And then, if you cannot do the pose, and you're a beginner, well then there are modifications. I'm using my, <laughs> if you're watching the video version of this podcast, well then I'm using air quotes. There are modifications with blocks and straps and blankets and knee bending or arm bending for those who cannot do the, the right pose, the standard pose, even I use that language there for whatever reason. And then, once you've nailed the pose, and so modification strategies and modifications are for those who cannot do the pose for whatever reason. And then there are variations. Variations, once you've done the pose, well now you can do a twisted variation, or you can put your arms and hands in different places to take it deeper, take it further, take it more advanced. These should be ideas which are all super, you know, daily things if you're a regular yoga practitioner. If you're a teacher, we use these languages. I wanted this episode to question, healthily question all of these ideas. And I want to do it by going out of yoga and talking about basketball and horse racing. <laughs> Stay with me. You'll kind of like, where are we going with basketball and horse racing? That's not got anything to do with yoga, but stay with me. I will be coming back to yoga. Basketball. The slam dunk. The slam dunk where you run at the hoop and gain airtime by jumping off the floor and slam dunking the ball into the hoop. Okay, that's a standard basketball move. Let's call that the standard. Now let's bring in the basketball students. We're only going to be two and I'm going to use two extreme uh, body types to illustrate a point. There is a hobbit, hobbit from J.R.R. Tolkien's uh, mythical series, a very short person, and there is uh, a very tall person. Let's call them Gandalf, for want of a, another term, but a tall, spindly person, very, very tall. Now, you're going to teach each of these people to slam dunk. I think you can see the 
challenge right away. Gandalf, he's a wizard and uh, probably can, you know, he's a little bit old, but he's got magic powers. He probably can jump, gain airtime, and he's probably six foot or more tall, or two meters or more. And he's probably gonna be able to slam dunk if you teach him, you know, leg strength and technique and power and uh, maybe dribbling skills along the way so he can actually get to the hoop to slam dunk. The Hobbit, on the other hand, is small. And I would doubt that a short person, maybe a Hobbit is an extreme example, but a short person, someone who's five foot or five foot and a half. I'm five foot, almost 11. I've never been able to slam dunk. Maybe one of the reasons I gave up <laughs> basketball but I've never been able to do it because I'm too small. Even if I gained amazing uh, powers to jump, I wouldn't be able to jump high enough to slam dunk. So is, are we saying, and I don't think anyone in basketball would say, but is there a standard way for both Gandalf and Frodo, the Hobbit, to learn how to slam dunk? Clearly in basketball, answer is no. Gandalf, because he's tall, will probably be able to slam dunk. Frodo, the hobbit, can try and practice as much, but not all is coming. He will never be able to slam dunk in a standard human basketball court uh, on a hoop because he's just too short. Do we then offer modification strategies or modifications for the hobbit to slam dunk, getting him a step ladder or some stairs so he can walk up, get close to the hoop and then slam dunk. Is that allowed? Is that even on the um, menu? Is that something which we would uh, consider? Maybe, but I don't think it's practical in a, in, a, in a basketball game. Clearly, this is a silly, absurd example. Gandalf is tall and has the potential to slam dunk. Frodo is short and doesn't have the potential to slam dunk. We know just from these two extreme body types that not everybody is gonna be able to slam dunk. The tall ones possibly can, the short ones never can. Now, if we come out of um, basketball for a moment, let's go to horse racing. If you notice horse racing, horse racers jockeys are always tiny. So now the context, the paradigm of practice, the physical uh, competition is very different. If you throw a tall, large person onto a standard, let's say just the same horse, and a hobbit on the horse is gonna have to work way less. And the small, lighter person is always gonna be the better jockey because the, the horse has to work less uh, to, get, to get the speed up. And um, there'll be all kinds of tricks and stuff. And Gandalf with his long legs and long arms, you know, if he was gonna be like a, a Mongolian polo player, where they, the Mongolians are, uh, they do this thing where they charge along, canter along, and then they jump off the side, kind of do a vault over, bring the feet down on the other side and come back. And if you look at the ones who are really good at that, the guys are like, and gals who do that are tiny. They're minuscule, they're really small. There's never a really tall person because they're just too big and cumbersome and cannot, cannot do all the tricks. They cannot get up the speed. There's too much weight for the horse to carry. And then throwing their body around while the horse is galloping or cantering is just way too much effort. So, Again, this is in a very difficult paradigm here. The short-bodied person, the smaller, lighter person, is perfectly made to do those tricks and to gallop fast on a horse. The taller person with, taller with longer arms and legs and more body weight, no matter how hard they practice, are not gonna be able to do what the small hobbit-like person can do. This is just pure, I think fairly obvious to all of us that this is the case. Now, let's come back to the yoga world. In yoga, 
we have standards of poses. We have Pashimottanasana. This one, if you're watching the video cast. Right. Feet together, fold forward. We have Janu Shishasana. We have Paravrita Janu Shishasana. And there are always say, uh, and when I did my first yoga teacher trainings, this, these are the right places to put your hands and feet for the full pose. That's another word I hear around, like full expression of the pose. We don't maybe use the word standard. And the idea intrinsically, not explicitly, but implicitly put is that all of us, if we practice, we can do Parshimottanasana or Janu Shishasana or Paravrita Janu Shishasana or any other pose. And if you can't do it right now, well then there are modification strategies. For Janu Shishasana, often it's bend your knee because the assumption is that your hamstrings are tight and that's why you cannot fold forward and bring your hands on your feet. Now bend your knee, make it more accessible, modify the pose. And if you practice long and hard enough, you will eventually be able to straighten your leg and have your head on your knee or your shin, or even clasping your hands around your foot for a variation or a deeper expression of the pose. There are other ways of modifying this pose. You could sit on a block, or you could use a yoga strap. Again, so that the pose is more accessible, and that's words we use for those who cannot do the standard pose or full expression of the pose. This language, explicitly, there is a standard pose, but implicitly, with all the other instructions that we use, there is a way for everybody to get to Janu Shishasana. I often hear yoga teachers and yoga people saying, yeah, we're all different, so we might not be able to do it. But then we go and use language. If you cannot do the full pose, or if it's not in your practice, well then feel free to modify. And if you look around a yoga room, and you look at the students, it's very rare that students want to modify because who wants to do the modified pose? When you've got a whole bunch of people who are implicitly and explicitly given the instructions or the idea that there is a standard. Well, no one wants to do the substandard pose. Everyone wants to do the standard. And so I've seen beginners and other people refuse uh, to do modifications because often in culture of a class or even of a studio, and certainly in some styles of yoga, there is given implicit cues and explicit instructions that there is a standard, and again, I'm using the air quotes, uh, pose. And for those that can't do them, they can modify. Then at the other end of the spectrum, if you can do the standard pose, well, then you're given variations to do. Like, as, as I mentioned in Janu Shishasana, clasping your hands around your front foot, maybe even putting a block in front of the front foot or two blocks in front of the front foot so that you can deepen the pose. Modifications are always seen as advanced options for those who already can do, quote unquote, the standard. Now, this is a big subject, and my crude example earlier of the uh, Gandalf and the Hobbit in The Lord of the Rings on a basketball court and on a, a horse, we all, probably you laughed and went, well, of course, that's obvious. Gandalf will be the better basketball player and the Hobbit will be the better horse rider. But what I want to propose to you is that there are not so obvious differences amongst every yogi in a yoga class. Gandalf and Frodo have the same 200 and something bones in their body, but Gandalf's bones are longer. 
Frodo's bones are shorter. Well, this concept goes through every bone in the body. Bones are not only different proportions and lengths, but all of the bones in our body can be different lengths and shapes. And things can face in different directions. Some of the bone sockets, the joint sockets in the shoulders and, and the hips particularly. And if this is the case, and I'm going to propose to you that it is, and it is, then it is not good anatomy to say that there is a standard pose. Just as you wouldn't say is, there is a standard way of doing a slam dunk or there is a standard uh, right, horse riding technique. Those are obvious examples that we would all guffaw and agree together that that's not the case. Small people can't slam dunk without springs or a trampoline or bouncy shoes or step ladder or stairs. So why in yoga do we use this language? I propose that we need to completely jettison this. There is no standard pose for any yoga pose. And that means there are no modifications to standard poses if you can't do it. And there are no variations on the standard. If we are all different and we have the same number roughly of bones, but our bones are different lengths, our sockets joint, uh, face in different directions, and our bones are different shapes and sizes and vary in a myriad of different ways, well then there is no standard. In fact, there is just a reference. There is just in my Pashimottanasana, there's just a seated forward fold. That's what we're doing. And there is no your feet must be together, there is no your toes must be pointing in a certain direction. There is no modification for people who haven't got to the standard yet. And there is no variation for those that can want to take it further. Just like our the basketball example I feel is the most obvious. Frodo will always need springy shoes or a stepladder and Gandalf will not. Frodo should never be made to feel like he's worse or of lesser value in any way. What well, we could do Gandalf certainly has more potential as a basketball player than Frodo. But the value of these two people are the same. And Frodo has more potential as a horse rider than Gandalf does. If this is the case, if we not only have differences like height, we have other differences. Some of us have blue eyes and green eyes and brown eyes. Some of us have different hair colors and skin colors, different um, sexual identities and shoe size and uh, leg length. Ver uh, the variations are endless. We know all of this and we should take this in to our yoga practice also. There is no standard yoga pose and therefore there are no modifications and are no variations. I propose that we throw all of this language out. Now this makes it very, very challenging for those of you listening to this who use all of those cues. Pose progression or pose regression. Those are other words that we use. I propose that we completely reconsider what the postural yoga practice is about. Because if we don't, this language and this culture of standards and uh, 
modification strategies and um, variations leaves yoga practitioners in two camps. There are the people who can and the people who can't. And I tell you, the people who can, they feel a little bit, you know, good about themselves. These are the teachers and even the rock star teachers and the uh, workshop leaders and the teacher trainers. Almost invariably, not everywhere, but almost invariably, these are the people who can do all of the standard poses. And sometimes they're examined on this. I certainly was in my early yoga teaching career. And if you're not able to do them, well, you, you're not qualified to teach because the assumption is that everybody, if they practiced hard and long enough, should be able to do them. Obviously, basket people, basketball people know this is not the case. And actually, you can go into almost any other sport, swimming, running, rugby, sumo wrestling, ballet. They know, these people, that it's not possible for everybody to become ultra competitive. But then you have the other people who are always modifying. They go on for weeks, months, years in a class, modifying a pose if they're in a place. And they never get to the standard variation. How do they the standard pose, how do they feel? Well, they feel <laughs> terrible is how they feel. And eventually most of them will give up because they try sometimes really hard and sometimes injure themselves trying to get to standard poses. And I was told way back in my yoga career, no, 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 that's not the way to do that pose. And if you wanna get in this style, then uh, you've got to learn to do that. And I later realized that I would never do that, and I never made it in that style. Simply because I couldn't do a standard pose. Now, this has nothing to do with weight and sex and race. This is pure cold anatomy, what I call variable anatomy, which I've learned from my uh, teacher, Paul Grilly. Now, this approach and understanding that we are all different means that anyone who comes to a yoga class and any teacher who teaches a yoga class, rather than relying on aesthetics and uh, visual cues for whether a yoga pose is being done well by a student, we have to reconsider what yoga poses are doing. Paul calls it practicing functionally, and that has been the way that I've practiced ever since I found his approach and now teach it and train others too, as well. Yoga poses are not standards. Rather, they are simply archetypes, and each archetype or general shape has a very specific function, like Janu Shishasana here is a hamstring stretch. How each and every individual who comes into that pose is gonna do it is gonna vary. So yoga teachers in this approach need to take away their dogma and their uh, predisposed cookie cutter shapes and standards and be open to or first educated in difference and then taught to be able to teach anybody into any pose, any body, not anybody, any body, any body, any bone shape into a pose. This means a lot of the cues that you use have to be dropped. A lot of the intrinsic or implicit or explicit cues that we use have to be dropped. So that you don't render one set of students superior and another inferior so that you don't have some who are advanced and some who are always modifying. Of course, this is what I spend my days and weeks and months doing, training people to see yoga in a different way. I'm predominantly well known for yin, but I teach hatha yoga uh, as well. 
And I will always have people coming on this course, the yin yoga and variable anatomy uh, program that I teach, who are amazed that and are liberated by the knowledge that no matter how hard you practice, some poses are just, some standard poses are just never going to come to you, but that doesn't matter because it's not about doing the poses. Of course, you can come on my website and look at my trainings and you can see uh, where this all goes. This knowledge has completely transformed my yoga practice and I just can't go back to looking at standards or saying to students that they need to modify because they can't do the pose. This is incredibly humbling because those who can do the standards have to also are invited to consider that rather than being only have practiced hard and worked hard, they're also blessed with the body, just like the tall person is blessed and able to play basketball and the short one will never compete in that. This is a huge level of the playing field and changes massively what the yoga experience and the yoga practice is about. So, practice well. Practice softly with love. Thank you for listening and I'll see you around. Take care.